Carlton's a researcher at Los Alamos who I've had a chance to work with a, a bit. Um, he's had some great ideas on uh, improving job by, so the, the status change uh, idea started out a year ago, um, and my first reaction is that that's going to break all the models, but um, that's going to happen anyway, so we decided to go through with that, um, and I'll let Carlton talk about our models.jl. Thanks, Miles. So um, it's a pleasure to be able to tell you all about Power Models. I'm very excited about the Jump community and, and what Miles and everyone has been doing here. Um, I should mention that I'm listed as the speaker here, but this has been a collaborative effort across a lot of different people. So please check out the GitHub contributors. Everybody has, uh, has given a significant piece to this project. So in the interest of the meetup nature of this, I wanted to start, before I get into the real talk, just telling you a bit about myself and where I work in hopes that it might spur discussions later in the week of uh, random things that are of interest to you. Um, these days I do operations research type of computational research. I develop a lot of algorithms, uh, but I'm trained as a computer scientist, so I've got a BS at the University of Connecticut and a PhD from Brown, and uh, these two guys are amazing professors who taught me basically everything I know about computer science, so thanks to them. Um, because of this, I know about CS stuff, so I care about things like software engineering, programming language design, and you'll see in this talk that my research takes a very computational-centric focus because of my CS background. Um, these days I'm doing, I would say, discrete optimization research. Uh, I'm a bit of a generalist. My PhD was in how to hybridize different methods. So like I know a lot about local search and heuristics, uh, constraint programming. I, MIP is like one of the weaker areas that I know about, but I know a bit about it. And then um, lately I've been getting into nonlinear programming and mixed integer nonlinear programming because the kind of domain that I'm interested in in power systems, this is the natural way to model those. Uh, if you're interested in the kind of things that I know, I help co-teach this course on Coursera called Discrete Optimization where we give this super fast intro to the big ideas in a number of these uh, topics. Where do I work? I'm currently at Los Alamos National Laboratory. I work in a group called the Advanced Network Science Initiative. This is a group of about 10 people that have very diverse skill sets. We have people who specialize in optimization, machine learning, more applied math, and even statistical physics type of people. Uh, where what unifies us is a set of application domains around complex networks. So think of things like electric power, natural gas, water distribution, uh, any kind of a network system, we're interested in that. And we do a lot of novel algorithmic developments because it turns out when you want to optimize these complicated systems with a lot of physics equations in them, uh, it, it's really like the frontier of what solvers can do on their own. Probably the most important thing about our group is that uh, we love Julia Opt. Miles came a number of years ago and kind of got everyone on board. So now it's really impossible to work on our group without touching Julia Opt and Julia in some way. So if you really like working in Julia, it would be great to talk to you. Um, you know, maybe we can work together. Maybe you can come visit us. Uh, it's it's uh, just part of what we do now. So I'll begin like the real part of the talk now. Um, I was thinking about what could I cover in about 30 minutes for power models. There's a lot of infrastructure behind power models. So I decided to really focus on first the motivation for why I'm building this package and what its goals are, uh, and then give you like a brief int introduction as a user what it's like to use power models. Uh, if you think this stuff is interesting, I would be happy to go into more depth like one-on-one -on -one after. Uh, the talk about how we engineered it and, and stuff like that, but it's really like a, a high level view of what we're trying to do here. So um, let's begin with the motivation. Power network optimization is really complicated. This is a mathematical program for basically the simplest steady state AC power flow optimization problem you could you could think of. It's uh, got the bold characters here are constants. All of the non-bold characters are variables. So you've got some really crazy expressions here, like products of two different variables times cosine or sine, uh, and then it, it just is a big old mess. But still, this problem has the feel of kind of a traditional OR network uh, flow type of problem. These constraints represent flow conservations at the nodes in the network. 
These constraints model the physics of power flowing across the line, so that's uh, something the physics brings. And then these are line flow limits. So like at a very high level, it feels like a network flow type of optimization problem. But the nasty thing is it's a non-convex uh, program, and we know it's not, in the general case, it's not an easy one because there's this wonderful paper that shows that even for a tree network, finding a solution to that system of equations can be NP-hard. So at least in the general case, this can be a really nasty optimization problem. So what do people do in practice? They use things like this DC power flow approximation, which has no guarantees about the original problem. But the beautiful thing is that all the physics has been linearized, so you can throw this into a MIP solver and build all sorts of interesting applications from there. An approach that's become more popular recently is the idea of uh, power flow relaxation. So now we're going to have a nice guarantee that we include every feasible point of the original non-convex set. And this is one of the simplest uh, forms of a convex relaxation. And you can see that these two constraints, one is a second order cone, the other one's just a convex cone, um, are, are convex. So this is uh, an easy, I guess, problem to solve. So. In doing R&D in power systems, I've run into two core issues. One of them is about power flow formulations, like the different things I was just showing you there. Another one is about test cases and uh, how we conduct benchmarking. And I'll just go into what those challenges are in a little bit more detail. So the first one is uh, what I call the formulation problem. And it really comes down to the fact that it's possible to publish a new approximation or relaxation of the power problem um, without comparing to many of previous works. You might take like a method that's 10 years old, or you might uh, just take like the standard off the shelf thing. Uh, Matt Power is a, a common package people are using. They just compare against Matt Power and they say, okay, it's better than Matt Power, so I'm done, like published. Uh, the other thing is that uh, this has resulted in an explosion of proposed alternatives to how to solve the power problem. And a lot of them are actually really hard to find. They're kind of buried in the literature and you don't know where they are. Uh, and I, based on what I know right now, I wouldn't say there's a clear top performer. If you look at the citations of all these different formulations that are being proposed, they're all about the same in terms of citations, so it's, well, they all look about equal. So this has been a challenge. And just to give you an idea of how many there are, this figure is showing you a taxonomy I built of different power flow formulations in the literature. Um, there's a subset which are just relaxations in the lower right, but if you, in the top right, this is like all the different variants that have been proposed in 2014. There's been more since then, so this is an even bigger graph. But you could imagine, like, which one should I use for my problem? You're not going to implement every single one of those and test them. We really need to know, like, which are better and, and stuff like that. So the other issue here is an instance problem. So it is possible as well to publish by only testing on a few test cases, like let's say five to 10 input networks. And uh, unfortunately, the test cases which people are typically using have been very easy. So for example, they'll have a convex objective function and there'll be no binding constraints at the optimal point. So this is like an extremely friendly type of input. Um, and industry is more or less ignoring results that are coming out of academia. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but one of them is that the test cases that academia is testing on are either too small or too easy. So they're just like, oh, well, it doesn't apply to our problem. Who cares? So what has been my solution to both of these issues uh, in doing this research? Well, it's a novel scientific methodology, which I call brute force R&D. Basically, we're just going to take all of the formulations that are in the literature and all of the test cases that we can possibly get our, hand case on, or our hands on, and we're just going to run them all and then see what happens. And the beauty of this approach is that no clever ideas are required. You just need a lot of work. Uh, so a while ago, um, I built like this, more, this many or more ample models to model all those different formulations that people have proposed. Uh, it was a lot. And I started uh, building this test case archive that we try to use for benchmarking different algorithms and power systems. Um, and this archive includes 35 base networks, at least. I think it, I just increased it a little bit. Uh, and then there are two variants, API and SAD, which are more challenging versions of the base networks. So now you have, like, let's say, 100, over 100 cases which you can test on. So uh, what was the, fir the, preliminary, the first outcome of this brute force R&D approach? There's a paper called uh, the QC Relaxation Theoretical and Computational Results on Optimal Power Flow. And kind of the core 
figure in this paper is a table where I just have power flow formulations on the x-axis and non-trivial inputs on the y-axis. And uh, it's just like, look at the table, see what happened. And there were a number of interesting unexpected insights just from doing this basic analysis. Uh, so that was a, a very nice outcome. So what did I learn from doing this brute force approach? I found that uh, reproducing previous works in power systems is incredibly challenging. There's a lot of details in the modeling, and if you don't get them right, it like may totally screw up your results. So having a base implementation uh, to reference while you're building a new method is incredibly valuable. Another thing that I learned in doing this is that Ample was not built for this kind of research. There has limited means to avoid uh, excessive code replication. There's like, you can't build a function, for example, that would build a bunch of constraints for you. Um, it's really hard to automate Ample at the command line. I had to do some very clever tricks to make that happen. Uh, and then, believe it or not, in doing this big experiment with like all formulations and all models, my licenses for Ample were the bottleneck of doing that experiment because all of the solvers were open source and I had like a cluster of computers to run it on, but I only had one amp Ample license, so I had to like, that was the bottleneck. Uh, so that was a problem. Another interesting uh, thing I learned in doing this is that there's a bit of what I would call the mat power effect, which is that it, in this research community, if a formulation is not implemented in mat power, it does not exist, at least for a, for a wide majority of PhD students working in this area. So they really don't want to like go to a paper or read a formulation implement. They just want a tool, which when they put it in, they get the thing that's in the, described in the paper. Uh, so. Uh, that's an unfortunate situation. So this is really the inception for powermodels.jl. Uh, it's a baseline, it's intended to be a baseline implementation of a lot of powerful formulations that have been in the proposed in the literature with the hope of mitigating this map power effect and making it clear in a common computational platform, you know, what are the pros and cons of the different proposals. Um, I've been, I'm really happy to report that using Julian Jump has resolved a lot of the issues I had with Ample. I've found that it's very easy to automate from the command line and run these big experiments. Because it's fully open source, even all the way down to the solvers, uh, then it's incredibly easy to run large scale experiments with like hundreds running in parallel. And then I've been really happy that Julia has enabled me to do some pretty advanced software design features which make my life a lot, a lot simpler. So my dream for power models, at least in the near term, is that <clears throat> I learn a new power flow formulation has been proposed in the literature, and in, it is implemented in power models and released on like the master branch in seven days or less. It should be very easy to add new formulations and then just run them on all the test cases. And if you look into the code of power models, you'll see that there's a lot of abstractions in there, and that's really to make this dream possible. Like, I want to make my life very easy if I need to add something new to the system without having to change a lot of other pieces of the code. So uh, just to highlight the value of open source, this is the table that appeared in that paper I showed you. And now, this is the new version of the table which is built with just with powermodels.jl. And this is part of the documentation. I'll update it. I have to run an experiment to update it, so it'll update like every uh, maybe few months. But what's amazing here is you've got the same data you have over there in the table, but you've also got the commits of every repository you need to replicate this table. So if you like, just go in here and you're like, oh, how do you get that result? You know, check out that code, run on your local computer, you should be able to get that result too. So this is very exciting. <coughs> so what are some of the core features of power models? Uh, first off, I should give a caution. Uh, this is definitely under construction. I may make radical changes to how it works. So this be may become stale very quickly, uh, but the core ideas will be the same no matter what. Power models sits as an abstraction layer on top of jump. The average user doesn't actually care about their model. Maybe a more advanced one uh, cares about the jump model that we're creating, but the goal is to just make it super easy to run a standard analysis that power system people want. So they may not even see jump at all. So yeah, so the average user is not interested in the details. They just want it to work. Um, in the power community, this map power data format is the standard in research and development. It's a text-based format, basically a bunch of matrices, which is in uh, MATLAB syntax. 
So one of the core features that we have in Power Models is a parser for these data files. Uh, this is one of the biggest blocks of code in the whole thing, is how do you parse these data files. So here, uh, you, you import Power Models, you do Power Models parse file, you give it a file name. So this is just like a, the location on your drive where you can load raw text. What you get back is a Julia dictionary. It's been sanitized a little bit to make it easier to work with, but uh, by and large, it's uh, very similar to what this map power data format is because I think people are used to using it. So then you can do like a dictionary dereference and get a particular value out of the data that you may be interested in. And I know right now a lot of people, this is all they use power models for. They just like parse the data set, write their own model from scratch. That's great. If it helps you, that's great. Um, I'll also note that the parser currently um, supports user-defined extensions to the map power format so that you can incorporate new data that you might need for some arbitrary application you're interested in. Uh, so I refer you to this documentation for how that works. So what is it like to solve your first um, power model? We're going to look at the optimal power flow problem as the example. It's my favorite. So you import power models. You need a solver. Power models basically just sets up the jump model for you. It doesn't do anything about solving it. So we're going to use IPopt because it's, flex it's very flexible in which models you can solve. Then you just call this function run ACOPF. You give it the name of the file you want to load. You give it the solver you want to apply, and it returns you the result. Uh, if you want to run what's considered the DC uh, OPF, that linear approximation of the power flow equations, you just do run DC OPF, and it gives you the result. Now, uh, interestingly, there's, these two things are just shorthands for a more generic way of running an OPF problem. So you could instead do run OPF, say this particular data file, ACP power model, uh, which is a special type that's defined by the power models uh, framework, and then give it a solver. And the interesting thing here is that basically run ACOPF is just a shorthand for run OPF. And then run DC OPF is also a shorthand for run OPF, but with this different parameter, DC power model. And once you know this kind of uh, more general way of running the OPF problem, there's actually tons of these different forms defined in power models. So you can run, say, the second order cone convex relaxation by using this name. And you just really need to know a name of the, the list of names and what they mean. And you can run all these different variants of the AC OPF problem, or the, the OPF problem. The key point here is this function name isn't changing. So that tells you this should be the same version, like the same type of problem, just with different variants on the power flow equations. So let's look at inspecting results. You can do run OPF like this. You get back the results. The results is also a, a Julia dictionary, and it's standardized across all the different forms of the model. So like if you're uh, running a DC power flow or an AC power flow, you're going to get back the same set of values, and they'll be in the same structure. It's just that some values might be not a number because that they can't be represented in that form. But so uh, it's, it's a standardized output. You can do things like ask, like, you know, what is the objective value? What was the solve time? Um, and it, it has a version of a way of encoding the solution which is in the right units that power engineers are expecting. So it's like an abstraction layer on top of the jump solution. Just, it's a very thin wrapper, but just makes it a little bit more friendly for power people who don't want to know any more details than that. <coughs> um, another question I get a lot is how can I modify the network data? This is super easy. You just parse the, the data into power models. It's a dictionary, you just modify the dictionary, and then you can send that dictionary directly to any of these run methods and it'll work. So like the run methods are overloaded, you can either send them a string and it'll parse the file for you, or you can give them a data structure and it'll assume it's like the right kind of data. Um, then you can modify it again and run it again. Uh, it's that easy to modify network data inside of Julia. Um, Another question people have is like, well, what if I want to run an AC power flow or an optimal transmission switching problem? This is how we model this in, in power models. Basically, you have different, uh, the function name here, run PF, run OPF, that's telling you what is the problem class I'm interested in. You know, is it, is it a power flow or an optimal power flow? This argument to the function is the problem formulation. So when you combine the problem class with the problem formulation, you basically get a mathematical model. So we've broken this up into these two pieces. 
And uh, the reason there is that there you can clearly see, okay, I'm going to run all these different problems with the non-convex AC equations. Here I'm going to run the same set of problems, but now I'm going to use this DC linear approximation. And uh, we don't implement possibly every combination of problem formulation and problem class, but Julia will just uh, shout at you and say, hey, like, you can't use this combination because this function hasn't been implemented, and then either you can implement it or you can ask me to implement it. Uh, if you want to do a convex relaxation of the same problem, again, it's just use the same name you're familiar with, throw it in there, it should just work. Um, now, why did I pick this design with all this different uh, stuff? It's because it helps me organize the hundreds of possible combinations you could have between different problem formulations and then for different problems and then different versions of the power flow equations. Uh, I, I hope it brings some sanity to that huge list of possible, possible options. So I presume you're wondering, this is the jump me up, like where's jump in all this? So uh, if you're doing this run OPF function, it's actually uh, running two separate very generic things. So it's doing a build generic model with uh, the data and the form you want, and then it's doing a solve generic model. So like there's one step where it builds up the jump model and then another one where, where it solves it. Um, right here, this PM thing it returns is an internal power models data structure, which has a lot of different information you need for bookkeeping and power models. But what you can do is you can just do PM.model, and now you have the jump model that it built. And all that the solve generic model does is it applies a solver to a jump model, and then it takes the output, uh, the solution that comes out of jump, and puts it into the format that power models users are expected to see. So. Uh, it's that easy. You can modify it, view the model, do whatever you want at that point. Now, because we got this far, you can actually see a very interesting function here, which is called post OPF. This is where the actual kind of variables and constraints and modeling happens for a particular problem in power models. Uh, so I'll just show you briefly what that is. This is a function which sets up an OPF problem. It's totally independent from the formulation that you're trying to use. It's a very kind of high level abstract model. I've tried to name everything so that it feels like a jump model, even though it's doing a little bit more than that. Um, but the reason I showed this to you is that on the left you have the, mo the code, which is actually in the code base. On the right, you have a formulation that I would write in a paper, which uh, is a very high level. It uses complex numbers and complex number variables. And then these arrows are kind of showing you the mapping of like which line in the jump model corresponds to which line in this, in this paper. And uh, there's a few things which are implicit in the paper just for kind of ease of understanding what's going on. But it's almost one-to-one -one with the, the mapping from one side to the other. So that makes my life a lot easier in understanding and debugging what, uh, what model we're actually writing. So I'll just finish up with a roadmap of where we're going with power models. We use the version convention that uh, Jump has adopted. So basically, it's three numbers. The first one will be zero for some time. <laughs> the second one is reserved for breaking changes. And the third one is for non-breaking changes. Uh, so we had version 0 0.1, which was really just a first draft. I was learning Julia and Jump at that time, so it was really rough around the edges. Um, Miles came to Los Alamos, we had a lot of talks. Uh, I restructured a lot of things, and then the first public version was 0 0.2. We're currently on 0 0.3, which just has a lot of significant engineering improvements and a lot of bug fixes for random things. And in the near future, we're going to have 0 0.4, which w I'm going to do a massive renaming of basically all the functions. So I would, uh, I would warn you, like, to, if you're building a lot of infrastructure around this, like, just be warned. The names will change at some point. Um, and the reason there is that I need a naming convention which will allow me to add, like, you know, 100 different versions of these formulations to the, to the code. Contributions are welcome. Um, this is, I want this to be a community resource for established power uh, problems and formulations. So if you have one that's really you know, a good baseline for other people to compare against, we'd love to have it. Um, I'm excited to add new problem classes. I'm excited to add new formulations, especially complex ones. There's been these moment-based relaxations which have been proposed. It's not easy to implement those, so any, anyone who knows how to implement it, it would be great to get them in here. Um, and then, of course, there are plenty of GitHub issues. Always, pull requests are always welcome for those. So that's the end of the talk. Any questions or comments?
Yeah. So, uh, I guess I'm just wondering, so if you have, like, somebody that is in power systems that doesn't necessarily care about the population, you're saying that, like, you have it so that they essentially don't have to think about Trump, they think about the model. Yeah. Like, what is their workflow look like? Are they, like, constructing a network and then trying to get a solution back? Is that... Yeah, so based on the questions I've gotten, I have the feeling that most people want to use, say, solve ACOPF as a black box. So they're writing a meta algorithm, which is like, I'll pick the generator set points, I'll modify the network data, run AC power flow. And then now I'll analyze the results, and I'll take another step. So you could imagine like a receiving horizon control where you're doing like a black box simulation of the whole network. Uh, that seems to be the most common use case for people. Uh, I think another thing that people do is they just, they want, uh, what is the objective value of the convex relaxation or something like that? Or what is the generator set points of the convex relaxation? And they don't want to know how to implement a convex relaxation. Yeah. So um, these are all static problems. Um, in reality, are the problems static? Like... Or is it, like, I would imagine power flow is somewhat of a control problem. So when you say static, you mean, like, not uh, differential equations? No, I mean, like, you've got one set of data. And, well, I, don't, I guess I don't really, I don't really know. Mm -hmm. um, like, are you solving for a power flow for a particular one point in time? So <coughs> typically, like, the, the simplest class of power problems are one time point. The... Next kind of step of challenge is multi-time point, and uh, we would love to have that in here as well. So I would love to have unit commitment as a st established like problem people can test. The issues you run into when you go beyond the problems that we currently have is data. There's no data format standard. There aren't established test cases. Like there's just a there are formulations out there, but you know they're not super robust. So we have people in our group working on those problems, and I keep prodding them like, hey, can you take the five most common data sets and standardize the, the format and then let's build like a baseline for people to test on. But it's just not as mature an area in, in those topics. So I'd like to follow it. So, but, so you see that a lot of the problems, these problems are relatively stable. Yeah. And sometimes you could be that steady state is, uh, you care about except maybe the switching, there's a transient thing going crazy, but... Uh, mm. Yeah. So, I, so multi period, multi period discrete with a few periods would be an interesting extension. Yeah. So quasi steady state, I think, is what they call it, which uh -huh. is basically like you have a sequence of steady states that are far enough in time that you don't need to worry about the dynamics. Uh, and that those types of problems would be perfect extensions for, for this and method. And is that just because of the the, the complete dynamic would be too complicated, or, or, or is it because you, like the dynamic in between is yeah. you expect not not too many weird things to happen? It's just about time scales. So, uh, like if you're thinking about say switching lines, maybe you do it on the order of uh, minutes, tens of minutes, mm -hmm. and the transient effects will usually resolve in one minute or less. Uh, okay. Uh, and if you're doing unit commitment or market clearing, it's every 15 minutes or every half hour. And that minute, I mean, whatever that happens on that minute will not be changed, I mean, will not have a significant cost or, or issue. Well, definitely it doesn't have a cost. It can cause a cascading failure or something like that. So <laughs> the, when you're making <laughs> significant <laughs> changes, <laughs> you, you really want to check the dynamic stability. But that's like a whole other bag of worms. Uh, that is kind of, we're still getting our hands around, like, how do you properly optimize, say, nonlinear, uh, uh, quasi-steady state? So then you could say, okay, how do you do the dynamic one as well? Okay, so there's some approximation of the dynamics to be able to, at least it's like, okay, you're going to switch from here to here, and you're not going to have a cascading failure. Mm -hmm. Figure it out, that constraint will be useful. Absolutely, absolutely. And some people have worked on kind of, uh, approxim ways of approximating dynamic stability as steady state constraints. Yeah, Miles? Um, have you found cases where the model building time is a bottleneck? So, maybe one thing we could look at this, uh, this week, when the first time that I build the model, it's slow, and I don't know like exactly what the sources of that are, uh, but after that, it's super, super fast. So, I think the answer to your question is no. 
Yeah. I think for most of the cases, people are normally running the very conventional OBF. Maybe they need to add some uh, renewable generation, for example, mm-hmm. or uh, energy storage. So uh, as far as I know, the, the map power provide very limited capability to modify the, the OBF model. They only uh, allow us to, to add some linear constraint and, and mm-hmm. just modify the, uh, the, uh, the object function a little bit. So does your package provide the flexibility for the user to modify? Yeah. So um, I didn't really go into it, but you could go, I could do a whole talk just on how would you write the model using this kind of formulation, which is on the left here. But inside of the uh, code base, you'll see examples of like, oh, what if I want to add, I want to change the objective function a lot and add a new variable. You can kind of hybridize this style with like raw jump syntax and, and modify it. So there's a bit of a learning curve to understand the abstractions that are here. But once you do, it's very easy to modify it, make a new formulation, uh, and do really ad hoc stuff. So like it. Theoretically, I can uh, add any type of constraint, uh, not only the linear, right? Yeah. Well, any anything that jump supports, you can do in this uh, framework. So there, there are some kind of constraints which are maybe hard to model in jump, like all different or something. But mathematical expressions should be very easy. Yeah, Chris. How well does IPOP do on the non-convex problems? Like, does is the objective like typically like, I don't know, not too much worse than the convex relaxations. So the big kind of scientific result that I've had over the past couple of years is that for the vast majority of cases we have, IPOP finds the global optimal solution Mm -hmm. to the non-convex problem. So we have been developing new relaxations, new relaxation tightening methods, basically just to prove that the thing you get from IPOP is great. which is, it's a very well-behaved problem for some reason, and uh, it's not well understood because I showed you the result. We know it's MP-hard in general, but like every one of these realistic data sets is super easy for IPOP. So that's really weird. 